Great that you're all here. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first panel discussion of today. Our topic is digital scarcity. Will central banks be obsolete within this century? And uh, in the next 45 minutes, we want to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of digital scarcity and a hard cap supply versus fired money, the impact of new players in the money game like Facebook's Libra, the topic of central bank digital currencies, and how that all relates to Bitcoin. Please feel free to ask your questions during the, dis the, the, the discussion on Slido. We will answer these in the last 15 minutes. If you go on your website browser, the URL is www.slido.com and then put in the hash key VOB. So, um, yeah, I hope that uh, Daniel will put that on the screen later on. So now, at first, let me introduce the participants of this panel to you. Uh, at first, from the left-hand side, Mr. Beat Weber. Hello, Beat. Beat is an economist at the Austrian National Bank and also the uh, cryptocurrency expert there. Then we have Rahim Takisagedan on the next... Um, to the right, no, to the, yes, to the red from <laughs> Beat. Um, I believe he's the one and only Austrian economist located in Austria and a philosopher and entrepreneur. Then I want to introduce Arthur Stadler. Hello, Arthur. Arthur is the co-founder and partner of Stadler Völkel Attorneys at Law, a law firm in Vienna that is speci specialized uh, on blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And here I may introduce Mr. Aurel Schubert, who has been working for 25 years for the Austrian National Bank and was Director General at the European Central Bank. Hello, thanks for coming. So, let's start this discussion with an opening statement, please, by every one of you that will give our audience and also your partners a feeling where you stand in that discussion. The question is, what is Bitcoin in your opinion, and where do you see Bitcoin in relation to central banking? Please, Piat, start. Okay, uh, Bitcoin has many aspects, but uh, in economic terms, I think the most obvious, uh, almost the best comparison in terms of what already exists is a collector's item. So a collector's item like old records, old stamps, has two prime features which attract investors, which is a credible scarce supply, a fixed supply, limited edition uh, LP from a famous group, for instance, uh, and a good story about it. Yeah? Why is it attractive? Yeah? There's many scarce objects in this world, but some of them are ascribed value in the market, some are not, depends on the story about it. And Bitcoin has for a time uh, been uh, neighbored by a, a great story. This is the future of money or a fantastic investment object or what have you. Uh, and it's scarce supply. So it belongs in the category of uh, collector's items. There are many collector's items in the, in the world. And yeah, the relation to central banking is not that obvious to me. Hey, great, I can start with this agreement. I was like that. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, Bitcoin is essentially a collector's item. I think you should go by the uses and the utility it has for people. I think that's a, a more practical approach coming from the Austrian School of Economics, of course. We need to empathically understand why people are using it and uh, if it functions this way. And there, I think, are two uses that have been most important for it and uh, then of course as a technological question if those uses have been fulfilled I think they have been the first use case is avoiding capital controls in particular Chinese capital controls uh, and I think there is a legitimate need for that use case uh, and I think it has had obvious utility for that use case and the second use case is the search for uncorrelated financial assets which, uh, of course, is a search for more and more exotic uh, financial assets. Uh, and I think this utility, uh, this use case is very legitimate. And it has proven utility because it has been the most amazingly performing asset class uh, in, in the past. Uh, uh, so 
just for very down-to-earth realistic assessments of use cases, I think you see uh, that it's more than just a collector's item. And what's the relation to central banks that, in particular, those both two <laughs> use cases are, of course, produced by central banks. First, capital controls are an obvious correlate and consequence of intervention, monetary policy interventions uh, in the market. And second, uh, of course, the search for uncorrelated assets is a direct consequence of monetary policy. Thanks. Continue here. Uh, I totally agree with your point of view, and uh, but it's not uh, something matching here or there. But uh, what I see, or what the question is also, uh, the pro side of Bitcoin. Um, I see Bitcoin as a factual thing, first of all, and then going into legal issues, legal challenges. As a factual thing, I th well, in my humble opinion, we need to consider what's the pro side, which is quick transactions with very low costs, with almost no intermediaries. And that's something essential, and then put on this, that's, that's the basis and put on this. We have to consider in my function as a lawyer uh, and see uh, the legal hurdles. We see also, which is pretty nice and pretty uh, useful, especially in the e-commerce sector, you would need something like a digital cash, something which is irreversible, uh, and that's not the credit uh, card system. We need it for the e-commerce sector, digital uh, cash, yeah, like cash, irreversible action, which cannot be reversed, obviously. Yeah, so that's on the pro side. Obviously, there's always a con side, and we will later come uh, to the discussion of CBDCs, which is very interesting and also a challenge for the national banks. On the con side, obviously, we have legal discussions on, on, on anonymity, on AML rules, on compliance with these rules and later on also with data protection when we get into Thank the discussion of CBTCs. Thank you. Okay, now thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And, uh, and uh, I mean, obviously the topic Bitcoin is, is very topical also for essential bankers and, and now professors. But maybe uh, when you entered here, when you came to the this nice palace, you might have seen that on the other side of the palace there is a sort of museum of illusions. And uh, so maybe one day sooner or later uh, Bitcoin will be one of the objects on display there. But uh, coming to your bank question about central banks, I'm sure central banks and also the Torsten Polite fiat money, I'm convinced, will not be an exhibition point anytime soon in the museum of illusions. So. Now, maybe I'm a little bit biased uh, after 33 years in central banking and uh, both on a national and European level. And actually, I joined central banking the year when Ken Rogoff wrote his famous paper about central bankers should be conservative. Uh, so maybe that, uh, that uh, affected it a little bit. But I, I don't want to be the party pooper here. And obviously, there are plenty of uh, experts who are very much uh, uh, for, for, for Bitcoin. But I think, uh, I mean, it's clear that the market wants the digital market wants and demands uh, some quick, safe cross-border payment solutions available 24-7 uh, and smooth uh, in smooth exchanges. And, uh, and we have a lot of current local payment solutions. However, they are no glo not global. Uh, they are also compartmentalized. And so maybe they are not all fit for, uh, for the globalized economy. Uh, but Bitcoin, uh, in my view, is, is, is not a currency, is not, not, not the solution. And if you look at, and we don't have charts, we didn't bring any charts, if you just look at the value development of, of Bitcoin, uh, yes, yeah, could have been a good investment if you were at the right time entering. Uh, if you're entering at the wrong time, you might have lost uh, two thirds uh, within a very short time period. So it's always a question also, uh, like when to get in, when to get out. Now, why do people hold bitcoins? And it was, you know, it's an asset class or so. I think the focus currently is on making capital gains. So, on the whole idea of buying cheap and selling high, selling to somebody else, finding a bigger fool, so to speak. So, it has a little bit of, and also, a hobby of economic history. It sounds a little bit like a, like a Ponzi scheme and to finding a bigger, bigger fool. Uh, 
uh, to ma make the buck. And uh, maybe that will be different once we have more stable, but currently the development has been very, very uh, uneven. And you just mentioned capital controls, maybe in China, but in Austria, for instance, and in the European Union, we uh, got rid of capital controls uh, 28 years ago. Uh, so I think um, capital controls is maybe not a good argument, maybe the anonymity, but that's more in the, in the con side because, as you mentioned, there are a lot of concerns about, uh, uh, about the wrong people using it for the wrong purposes. So, and, uh, and so go, coming back uh, a little bit to the functions of money, okay, uh, Thorsten Polite just convinced us there's only one function, but there are sub-functions, so we can still uh, go to the three, three functions. But the medium of exchange function, currently, next to my university, to the Wirtschaftsuniversität here, there is a, 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 a nice uh, traditional Austrian uh, restaurant, which is called Luftburg, and they are the only one I know which says on the menu that they also accept bitcoins. Uh, I don't have any, so I've never tried to. But otherwise, it's not really universally accepted. So this medium of exchange function uh, is not here. And partly, it might have to do that also the, what I hear, and I've read that uh, the transactions are sometimes very expensive and also very slow. There uh, can be take a long time, and it can be very, uh, very expensive. So finishing for the moment, uh, just to quote, uh, um, um, Benoit Curé, um, one of my former bosses, that you know, it's, um, Bitcoin is a clever idea, but not every clever idea is uh, also a good idea. And not to go as far as uh, Augustine Carsons from the BIS said that it's basically a combination of a bubble, a Ponzi scheme, and environmentally a disaster because we haven't yet talked about the energy consumption linked to it. So. That's my, my initial thought. Thank you very much. I mean, actually, I have a lot of questions here on my uh, iPad, but we could also just maybe, Rahim, do you want to answer some of the uh, biggest contra points, mm -hmm. maybe, because there were a lot, actually? Sure, there's lots, lots of disagreement. <laughs> uh, it was great, uh, so I really, really enjoyed <laughs> your talk. Uh, I think it's actually... Uh, well, one of your books that makes a very good case for Bitcoin, and that's the history of the uh, Kreditanstalt and the Fondant of the Kreditanstalt. Uh, and uh, there we see a pattern which is quite universal, I think, in the history of politics, and in particular monetary politics, is we see time and time again that the inclination of politicians, and in particular monetary, in monetary field, will be to avoid short-run uh, pain and consequences but go for the long-term negative impact uh, and that they do by intervention, direct intervention through central banks uh, uh, and uh, we've seen that pattern repeat and repeat and it's quite strange uh, that that's not considered an obvious Ponzi scheme because there's so much historical track record of it being a Ponzi scheme uh, with a lot of people benefiting and really quite obviously people on the top of the pyramid uh, if you follow the money flows where we have the Cantillon uh, effect uh, and other distortions which obviously have the structure of a pyramid uh, so it's a kind of enriching and distribution that's been going on for a long ter term for a long time and one of the obvious beneficiaries of this kind of intervention has been redistribution from the saver towards war waging politicians because without that kind of intervention we wouldn't have seen this kind of destruction which was very costly very uneconomic and only possible because we have these unsustainable pyramidal structures of redistribution and distortion uh, in the field. And I think that uh, one shouldn't uh, look at it in the sense of a solution. You said Bitcoin is no solution, it's not universally accepted. I think it's a totally wrong way to look at it because that's the totalitarian way. It's like there's one solution for everyone and now we got to impose it and as long as we are not convinced that it's the right one for everyone, no one should do it. Uh, it's kind of binary state idea and that's the opposite of an open society where you experiment, where you figure out if it can be a solution for your problems, your use cases, uh, and that's why it's of value, it's an experiment that's going on. It may provide some solution, it has obviously provided solutions to people, um, and uh, so I think it's better to look at it from a dynamic perspective and not just ask the question, is it money or not, or what's the perfect money, because that Hayek uh, has taught us money is an adjective, so it's about moneyness and people trying to figure out what has better and more moneyness 
Always bearing in mind that the future is uncertain for every one of us, so there's no clear-cut solution and you, we cannot extrapolate monetary policy in the future. If you look at the past, we should be very wary <laughs> about what's going on. We should be skeptical, we should be critical, we should be looking for alternatives, actively looking for alternatives, and the best people looking for alternatives are those actually in an entrepreneurial way or using the private funds, trying out experiments, maybe failing, most will be failing, but those who won't fail may be really crucial for the future of our society and the future maybe of the global economy as well. But just to add something on what you raised, uh, is it quick or not? I mean, depends what we, how we define uh, speedy transactions or not. But I, I think you're well aware of there's a report of the European uh, Central Bank years ago. They already said, well, a transaction made in Bitcoin is much quicker, much faster than traditional transactions. Um, yeah, and again, it's less cost involved. So that's again on the pro side. On the con side, you mentioned it. You just. Uh, uh, we're fostering my <laughs> uh, concern, which is the anonymity, obviously, yes. But uh, on the other side, it's a legal hurdle which is able to take. Yeah? We have seen that in Europe there's a new AML rule, new AML directive, the fifth one, has been implemented also in Austria. Since the 10th of January, we have a registration for service providers in the, uh, for virtual currencies. So. This legal hurdle is able to be taken. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a legal hurdle which is in each and any area of business, making business. You need to know your customer. Know your customer. That's something which everybody in each and any activity, in each and any business activity uh, has to be done. We as lawyers need to do it. We do also, okay, we do also accept Bitcoin, by the way. So our customers can pay us in Bitcoin. <laughs> But before we start a, a client relationship with Bitcoin or without, we need to know who is our customer. So that's a, a typical obligation for each and any business activity. So a legal hurdle to take, yes. Still, the con side is super fast, super quick a transaction with a very low cost. And that brings us <laughs> again later to a challenge which is able to also be taken by the uh, national banks. It is not something of danger here. I think we are not acting against each other. Just as a message to the central banks or national banks, we see it as a challenge. We see it as something to think about and uh, we don't see it as a danger for the national regulatory system. Uh, Beat, may I ask you, you shook your head before when he was talking. Do you have any, uh, yeah, <laughs> like, no, no. Claimed that the European Central Bank uh, stated that Bitcoin is faster and cheaper than traditional. You may have misunderstood something or I missed the report. Yeah? To my, it depends on what you're comparing. Yeah? If you're sending cash uh, to Africa from, from Europe, wow. It will be slower than sending a Bitcoin transaction. Very true, yeah? If you say the time a credit card transaction needs to confirm, it's obvious, yeah? For Bitcoin, you take longer because at least these 10 minutes, unless a service provider uh, steps in, which are many, uh, who uh, makes a guarantee to you, yeah? But it's, uh, what do we compare, yeah? To say Bitcoin is cheaper and faster, that's too much of a... I don't know. Yeah. I can't take that serious. Yeah, and uh, if you look at the fine details, yeah, it's, it depends on what you're comparing. In general, the answer is no. Yeah, and there's a wide disagree, uh, wide agreement. On that. But if we talk about it from a global perspective, I mean, don't you think that there are advantages or possibilities for a common yeah, there, good? There are many innovations around the world in terms of who try to improve uh, faster payments, uh, and there's a obvious expectation among all observers of this market that there's, we expect a growing demand for fast and cheaper payments and cross-currency payments are cumbersome and expensive. It has to do with, with many obstacles like profit uh, taking, lack of competition, 
differences between national laws, uh, compliance risks, and what have you. And th but there's also a lot of innovation going on. Yeah, Bitcoin is one among many, many innovations in this field. You have many f fintechs which uh, exploit the innovations in central banking in terms of offering uh, fast payment infrastructures. And for, for big currencies, there's already uh, a lot of improvement. But central banks see this as a task uh, for where there's a considerable room for improvement. But it's a tricky issue which, where it's not definitely clear what is the problem and, and, and what can be done. But there's definitely a niche which we expect to expand. Uh, and, but yeah, this, uh, in terms of solution, Bitcoin is one among many issues. And there might be transaction where it's advantages uh, for the transaction parties to use Bitcoin and it's, uh, unless it's not, it's not unla unlawful. Thank you. Mr. Schubert. No, I, I just didn't want to get the impression I want to forbid it, but I think one should be honest about it, what it can and what it cannot. And even if I go out to the pharmacy and buy uh, something, there's always a BIPAC title, or whatever that's in English, which says what are the risks uh, involved, and one should be uh, clear, and uh, if people want to invest in it, that, that's fine with it. Uh, I'm no longer with the central bank, uh, strength and banking community, so I don't have to defend the, the tips, the tips, the target in, uh, instant payment system, which is, uh, I've lived half of my life in Budapest, and even there the bank now says in two weeks time, in two weeks time, transactions will happen within five seconds. Uh, so this is, and at the cost, the cost is 0 .0, 0 0.2 cents. So it is. <laughs> It is, and that goes immediately, and there is no clogging, and there can be millions of transactions at the same time. So I think just uh, uh, on that side. But I wanted to get more back to, 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 the, to the central banks and to what you said correctly. Um, there, were a, there is a cemetery full of uh, failed currencies in the world, but also the world has changed. As you said correctly, don't just uh, look at it also uh, over, over time. And, uh, uh, we are, at least in the last 20, 30 years, we have a consensus in the Western world, but also worldwide, of uh, outsourcing, so to speak, the monetary policy to a central bank, to an independent central bank. So even the, when I always hear the government does it, as I heard it before, from my good friend, uh, Professor Polite, I always get goosebumps because uh, the government creates money. <laughs> That's not the world in which we live in, fortunately learning from the experience of the past. So we have independent central banks, independent and accountable central banks, who by all, by all public opinions, when you look at surveys, have enormous trust, enjoy the trust of the public. And I read that even for issuing any kind of digital cyber currencies, people mainly would trust if it would happen from central banks and not from uh, some big, big uh, techs or, or others. So in that sense, I, I would just say, you know, the world has changed and we have, but what, where we all have to work together to defend the independence of central banks, which uh, at least in the Euro area, is uh, the ECB is the most, you might know, the most independent central bank in the world because its independent status could only be changed by a change in the European Treaty and the functioning of the European Union, which means that no longer 28, but 27 countries would have to agree, all their parliaments would have to agree to that. While for the Fed, you need only 50.1% of the congressmen uh, or congresswomen, uh, sorry, uh, to agree to change the law of the, of, the, of the independence of the Fed. So I think that is very, very important. So we all have to make sure that this is not... Uh, um, not uh, endangered, and uh, otherwise, uh, as I said, uh, um, or to, to paraphrase Mark Twain, the report on the central bank's death was an exaggeration. So I think they will be around, but they should be around as independent guardians of the stability of the money. And then I finish in a moment just also to put in some numbers, since for 21 years I was in charge of the numbers. I mean, if you look at the inflation rate, which is the debasing of money in, in the euro area in 20 years, the average was 1.7%. In the last 10 years, 1.3%. So that is, that is very, 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 very stable. So one cannot say there is here a, a big, big debasement going on. But that's already the outcome of the changes in the governance and the structures, which, which I mentioned before. Thank you. Rahim? Yes, uh, first, uh, some agreement and also some agreement here, so <laughs> respect to respect. Uh, if you, I, I agree that uh, uh, maybe uh, Bitcoin uh, is 
the cheapest and fastest way for large <coughs> transactions, large market value transactions, uh, not for small market value transactions, of course. Uh, and uh, for those who believe that the small market value transactions are <coughs> crucial, there are so many projects to go for and choose from, and I see them used on a day-to-day -day basis by people uh, who use their smartphones to transmit values. Uh, so, uh, but I, I agree that's not really the strong point about Bitcoin. It may become if it's a settlement layer, uh, and then of course it's the, I think, more important question. It's this kind of value transfer between institutions, cross-border transfer, and so on, uh, which is really important for even an international cooperation trade and exchange and production and so on. Those are the crucial things, not uh, how expensive it was to pay your coffee uh, uh, or not. And, uh, I, I use Apple Pay. I, I think it's really I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, easy, easy to use and fast and so on within the banked real. Now, I disagree uh, for some disagreement that there are no capital controls and it's unlikely that we'll have capital controls. I already see capital on controls if you define capital control as making it more difficult for compliance reasons to move money across borders. And that, of course, uh, for everyone who has to move uh, money has seen that this, the cost has increased and will certainly increase. And sometimes you even realize that for compliance reasons you're suddenly cut off from transfers. You know, the bank tells you, no, it's your money, but you can't move it there because we don't understand the business model of your investment, uh, or you can't <laughs> uh, move it, uh, or you can't buy that asset because they don't take any European clients anymore for compliance reasons because it's too much of a hassle and so on. Large parts of US-based funds were cut off from European clients and so on. So I think it uh, would be quite naive to assume that uh, it's for everyone just a question of seconds and cents to transfer value, the real value, I think that's important uh, uh, and crucial. Uh, now, um, what was the same thing? Yeah, about the uh, ideal of an independent central bank. I think it's a great idea. And like many great ideas, it's problematic. It's a wonderful idea, as wonderful as the division of powers. And that's what we all learn in school, of course. A democracy is determined by the division of powers. Legislative, executive, judiciary are to be independent and separated. And then maybe we have a fourth power, journalism, the media, and they are controlling it all. And now maybe we have a fifth power, the independent central bank. And of course, I mean, it's always a hard trade-off. You want to discuss it honestly. And if I'm really honest, I'd say it as like a ridiculous, very naive, appreciation of the realistic working of politics. I think it's great as an idea. I think one should be careful not to just destroy this kind of idealistic assumption as an ideal where institutions should be, but it would be very dangerous to assume that it's a description of reality. Now, of course, uh, central banks seem to have become more powerful, more important, thus independence is even more important. Yeah, but by becoming more important, more powerful, actually, we have all become dependent on the central bank. So I think it's an even more naive idea to think there's a kind of independence possible if almost everything and every institution so much depends on monetary policy now, and there's so much pressure on monetary policy, and everyone who cares about markets and money has to check almost daily what central banks are doing, and then claim it's a kind of independence, as a realistic description of where we are, not an ideal, and an all for the ideal, and I think you're completely right in regarding history, that uh, uh, those kind of interlinkage between politics and monetary politics has been a problem, but I don't see anywhere we, how we have separated the political spheres, the spheres of interest groups from monetary policy, I see the opposite, Maybe in a formal bureaucratic way, yes, they are institutions, thus they are large institutions borrowing lots of people and so on, but I think the ideal hasn't been reached and I think critical assessment should always look at what we are and what where we should be or could have been.
Thank you. Uh, let's talk, a, shift a little bit the focus to new players that are coming. I mean, it's not only Bitcoin. With Bitcoin and other blockchain uh, developments, we also have projects like Facebook's Libra coming in, for instance. Uh, as far as I understand, one of the tasks of the central banks is regulating and supervising the banking industry. How do central banks assess this problem? As we all know, Facebook actually does what it wants in the most cases and excuses themselves afterwards. So how will central banks um, cope with this new uh, topic, new players coming in, like corporate money? Please. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this... Uh the, the initiative uh, taken by the Facebook-led consortium was an interesting, uh, innovative idea which we took note of. And um, then the question started to uh, come. Yeah? That's what uh, regulator, uh, regulators and uh, central banks have been doing. Uh, put questions towards uh, Libra, which looks like a, uh, an attempt to establish a kind of uh, private central banking arrangement uh, based on a new currency and the impression is that they they haven't thought that much yet on, on what they're doing. They have put a lot of effort in technical stuff and uh, borrowed ideas which they claim to have something to do with blockchain. Uh, this, uh, you're better than uh, informed than me or, or on how to assess this claim. but. They have only the vaguest of ideas about what a monetary authority, which they, uh, they are practically uh, proposing to be, uh, is supposed to do, yeah? and which, which kind of rules apply for good reasons, and uh, what are the expectations uh, from a user's point of view, and from a level playing field uh, point of view, and all kinds of implication. And now they went home with a task list, or a set of questions, don't know what they do about it, uh, and I think authorities have made uh, pretty clear if, if you want to enter that market, consider this as a task list and come back later and tell me what you think about it. Uh, Arthur, may I ask you, uh, from the legal perspective, uh, where is Facebook Libra? Oh. <laughs> yeah, good question, yeah. I mean, I just would like to respond to what you mm -hmm. said, Beat. Um you uh, said you took note of it, yeah? and we see that there is a lot of discussions within the central banks or and even with, uh, outside. Um, central banks feel the breath in the back, yeah? in their neck, from Libra and others. Yeah? These developments are something to take note of, yes, to look at it, and there are major discussions at the central bank level. And we also see that, we observe that, and that's something, uh, yes, where, where this old system is going to run a bit faster. Yeah? We discuss what is quick or what is not, what is innovative, what is not, what is useful, but at least there is a discussion, there is an innovation to take note of, and that's something important. And that's, uh, yeah, that's one thing. The other thing is how Libra is, um, Established, yes, indeed, it's a major legal hurdle to take in each and any country. It is not, yeah, I mean, with the central banks, it's easy. It's a legal tender. You have a national currency that is by law legal tender. It has to be accepted. Uh, some, I don't want to defend here Facebook and Libra, but uh, as a private institution or private entity, you will need to go the long path the long way uh, having it accepted. You all know it where if you are working in with banks to get uh, your licensing, you, to get your uh, uh, um, payment service uh, license, to get your e-money license, that's a major hurdle. Yeah, and Facebook obviously needs to take this hurdle in each and any country where they want to be active. So, and there the legal discussion is not a big legal discussion, it's just a fact point of consumption, where you can consume that, there you need to be compliant. So it's not where Facebook has its seat, uh, it's where Facebook Libra is available, where the customer can obviously get this uh, token. 
And there you need to be compliant. Obviously. That's a fact. That's something to consider from a, a regulatory perspective. That's one thing from financial, from financial market uh, regulatory perspective. Plus, we have a major discussion, especially on Facebook. You said he was excusing, excusing himself uh, in, in the Congress. The data protection is another hurdle, um, which is apart from that discussion here. It's a big issue, and I personally do not see how this is going to be solved in the future. Yeah, I'm not being a lawyer, so I don't want to get into any of the legal, maybe just a few more governance and, and economic uh, short issues. I mean, we have talked before we started with Bitcoin, which is a very decentralized system and all the advantages of decentralization. If you look at Libra, uh, this is extremely highly centralized. If you look at uh, uh, it will be more cartel-like, all the, the different Libra as, um, bodies, uh, uh, so it's like, like a, a, car, a cartel, and so it's not like uh, the idea of cryptocurrencies being decentralized, and, uh, and Facebook, uh, you can imagine, uh, uh, if you look at it, the role of Facebook and its friends, they will act like quasi-sovereign issuers of money, you know, and, uh, but the thing is they are not accountable to the public, to, the, uh, to, to anybody outside, but to the shareholders and then to their members. So that is, and you just mentioned also the issue of private data, which is related to that. But there's also a few other interesting points is, for instance, that it will be, uh, the Libra coins will be backed by, by reserves. So they will be backed by fiat currency, namely by bank deposits and short-term government security. So, so it's, uh, it's at least funny because you, you have, you're creating a private currency, but then at the same time uh, you are uh, trying to cover its value by, 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 by uh, reserves from, from fiat uh, currencies. And then there are a few fundamental economic questions that there is no global lender last, of last resort. So what happens if something happens, which uh, we don't know. Uh, and the Libra Association has only a limited liability. <laughs> so <laughs> what happens? Uh, if you don't get anything back, uh, who will honor the Libra holders' uh, um, assets in this case? And so, not to go now, which is then the next step, what, what kind of consequences it could have then for monetary policy if really uh, Libra would be flying. Hmm? Thank you. So, let's go to the questions from the audience. Um, thank you very much. So, I'll take the first one because it has the most upvotes. What leads you to the conclusion that the ECB is an independent central bank when it holds hundreds of billions of euros, for instance, of Italian government debt? Okay. The <laughs> but that are two different, completely different things. You can mix up apples and oranges. Is it, it is independent. Legally independent, financially independent, personally, I could tell you all the five things which I just told my students at the Diplomatische Akademie this week. But the disparate aspects of independence. So, in its decision making, it's independent of policy making, and nobody can tell it what to do, except it has to fulfill its mandate, which is clear from the Treaty on the European Union, ensure price stability, and uh, and then, then define the system with the famous 2%, uh, and you know, the, you know the story. But for that, to implement your monetary policy, and that's always been done, that you buy securities. Now, in the last few years, uh, with quantitative easing worldwide, a lot of securities have been bought, but, uh, um, but they're all bought based on, on ratings, etc. So whether they are, and they are bought according to the capital key, so Germans, etc., German, Italian, Spanish, Austrian, uh, so I, I don't see where is here the, 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 the problem between independence and that you manage your portfolio like you manage your portfolio independently. Maybe Beat has something to say. Okay, I think you can hold the mic because the next question is also for you. Uh, what is the reason central bank banks accumulating more and more gold in recent years? Four central banks to accumulate more and more gold in recent years. I don't know. Uh, obviously, here we have also a problem because the, the questioners are all anonymous, anonymous, <laughs> and I'm the fool here. <laughs> the answer will be no, uh, no, 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 no. No banks. fools here. No fools here. <laughs> no. No. Uh, uh, 
I'm not aware. I mean, I have heard that, that maybe some Asian central banks or so are, are, yeah, are, Russia, are buying gold. But Russia. That, yeah. Russia. That's also partly Asia, <laughs> uh, but not 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 uh, not the ECB and. Um, but they also di diversifying their, their, their portfolio. I think that's, that's in line with, with the role of the dollar in the, in the world system, which is changing, and there are more conflicts in the, in the global economy or political system. And so when you buy gold, you, you sell a different thing. Yeah? It's not fiat currencies per se or something. Yeah? You want to uh, reduce your dependence on, on other foreign currencies. I think that's the main motive. Uh, for those central banks uh, which do that. Uh, because maybe just to, not to forget, once you hold dollars and you have the extraterritoriality of, of, of US law, <laughs> once you hold dollars and the US doesn't like you, then uh, you might not have access to your money anymore. And that's one of the, the big selling propositions of the Bank for International Settlements, why it is uh, such a big, uh, big institution helping central banks to, to, to place their reserves uh, outside of potential political problems. <laughs> yeah, I mean... The, the Try to if, if it was stable, because there are very, very strict rules on where, on where uh, central banks can put their money, there are very strict ratings, etc. rules, and once Bitcoin should happen to be stable, uh, one can look at it. Okay, next question. What would be the medicine package insert fine print for fiat money and for Bitcoin money? What are the top three points of danger? Are there any overlaps? So as far as I understand, the top three points of danger for fiat money and Bitcoin. <laughs> okay, I think... That's <laughs> Uh, if they go for the bypark settler, yeah. <laughs> uh, the medicine package insert, usually it's accompanied by the statement, ask your pharmacist or your doctor. Uh, and then, of course, that relates to trust issues as well. So I would only, if I'm not trusting the pharmacy, I wouldn't read the package insert and probably wouldn't buy the truck uh, on its own, so it doesn't really answer that much. Uh, and the question is, of course, and there's typically, I'd say, authoritarian answer that you got to have provide the package inserts for everything people are doing. It's this general idea that in every kind of question, there's a hierarchy of authority and experts who got to decide for you and tell you what's good for you. And I think some issues are so complex with such a bad track record of those authorities that you need, and it's quite, really hard, to start there using your own mind and there to find out on your own what kind of risks you can take, who you can trust, who you can't trust, and that can't really be answered for you. Because if it could be answered for you, then you are trapped uh, in a kind of trust trap uh, because if there is a hidden interest somewhere in those people writing the package inserts, it would be usually profitable for them and really dangerous for you in the long term. Just to add here, uh, we have clients in this area and uh, just to talk about the medicine package, uh, uh, BIPAC Zettel, um, actually as from a consumer uh, protective protection uh, perspective, you actually would need that. Yeah? in each and any, at least in the European uh, member states. Yeah? Um, we had a, <laughs> a proceeding running for a client of ours. We got a um, complaint by a consumer uh, protection authority in Austria. Um, not we as law firm, but for our client. And there it was stated that actually there were not sufficient uh, information packages, information um, stating what is it all about, where you can buy it, where you can sell it again, how is it uh, going up and down. So, yes, you would need, you should give all this information to your clients when selling Bitcoin. Yeah? When you're, if you're in an exchange um, or if you have an ATM somewhere, you should uh, state that and uh, declare to your customer uh, and to your consumer what you are actually selling. Yeah? And if you don't do that, or in a sufficient way, then your comp competitors 
could come and uh, make a claim, start an uh, unfair competition claim against you, or the Consumer Protection Authority in Austria, which is, or authority, it's an association, the uh, VKI, Verein für Konsumenteninformation. And then you would uh, need to declare all this and uh, have a five pager or a ten pager uh, saying where you buy it, where you sell it, what you can do with it, where the utility is actually, uh, and in a sufficient way, in a language, what your customer, what your consumers understand. I think if the financial industry is anything, it's a BIPOC title, Wirtschaft, it creates inflation <laughs> of information material and maybe even a, an ecological catastrophe <laughs> for all the paper that's produced. No one reads and no one really cares that much about. Um, let's try a little thought experiment maybe because I always wonder, I mean, Bitcoin in my view is uh, compared to private monies like Libra or EcoCash in, in Zimbabwe or Swish in Sweden, it's a public common good. There's no company behind it. So, and many people also, uh, the former director of the Austrian National Bank, I think, uh, says, okay, Bitcoin is digital gold. If you want to invest in it, you can see it as an asset. Uh, why do nation states, why are they not open more to open blockchains like Bitcoin and accept it as taxes or buy it, then you would have it and you could also stimulate the market or not? You mean accept it in taxes? Yes, for instance, why not? With the same reason why I don't uh, accept as a state your old socks in payment of taxes. Yeah, yeah but my I old socks think <laughs> I, as an entrepreneur or an institution or a state, I say what I will accept in payment for my services. Yeah? That's very hard. I'm, right. I'm the administrator as the state of a club which is called the state. Yeah? You're a member of it. You're born into this club, but you can exit if you don't like it. Yeah? And I set the terms of payment. And all five years, I. Uh, I run for office again and I'm either voted out or not. You know, so, and I dictate the terms of payment and I accept my own currency, you know, like every entrepreneur does. You know, I set the terms of payment. You know. I'm not saying the state is an entrepreneur. You know, so it's an institution yeah, who an sells services. Sorry? I mean an entrepreneur who imposes the means of payment wouldn't survive for long on the market. Of course, yes. Yeah. You say Coca-Cola Coca says, uh, I offer Coke in Austria for euros. Yeah? You can't pay me in old socks, you can't pay me in Bitcoin. Yeah? If I go to America, uh, Coca-Cola offers uh, Coca-Cola for dollars. Yeah? There are networks affect why they do this, yeah? because everybody, everybody else does so. But uh, it's, uh, I can say I, I, can, I, I write a book and I accept only Bitcoin in payment. That's not illegal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cumbersome for me. I have transaction costs, all kinds of hassles, but it's not illegal or out loud uh, to accept uh, different means of payment in my contract. We can agree on that. Yeah? So uh, the, two, the two of us, we, we, if we make a contract, it's not uh, legal. But there are specific reasons why rarely anybody does this, but because it's enormously advantageous for most participants uh, uh, to accept the, uh, the official currency. I like your statement uh, where you say Bitcoin is not illegal. Um, actually, absolutely correct. Yeah, we have AML rules in Europe, in whole Europe. Bitcoin cryptocurrencies are not illegal. Yeah? We have a law framework around that. If you buy, sell, you comply with it. That's totally legal. You have a definition. These are uh, assets which are not given out by a central bank. But, and also, I state also uh, like also your statement where you say that's a club where you can say what's your payments and what not. It's a line by the legislator. The legislator is saying what's my legal tender, what's my national currency. If you want to change that line, we are in a different game. That's exactly what you, I agree with that. And uh, maybe not in the next five years, but maybe in the next 10 years, there might be some uh, national banks who actually consider buying cryptocurrencies. Why not? Just, just to put a little bit maybe here, practicality or reality into the world. I mean, just imagine on the 18th of March, the finance minister will give his budget speech. 
So he's going to sell what, say to the, what is his budget proposal. So he will be very clear on his expenditure side. But on the revenue side, he say, you know, as people campaign bitcoins, you know, I know what I will receive, but by the time I'm sell, I have to spend it, uh, maybe it's only half of its worth. So maybe it's not 400 billion. Yeah, but he doesn't accept all the gold because uh, he has to pay his bills and if he gets 400 billion or whatever the tax revenues are, and, uh, but by the time he spends it, he only gets uh, 200 billion euros in goods or in, in uh, or he would have to accept that his, uh, his uh, civil servants, everybody accepts the bitcoins in payment and so they then again have the problem there because they have to pay their houses and their mortgages uh, in a stable currency. So I think one has to see this again. It all has all very much to do with, with, with how stable is this, whether can it be really be used uh, in the functions what, um, what money has and I'm still maintaining there are these three functions of money, <laughs> means of exchange, uh, unit of account, and store of value. Mm -hmm. Rahim, a short word on the volatility. How, will it, how do you estimate, will Bitcoin, how highly volatile will it be in the future? Uh, I mean, if it continues to be adopted like that by investors, volatility should decrease because volatility usually is a sign of financial markets that are not deep enough, so it's a kind of uh, experimental time, but people need to figure out uh, uh, how to value uh, that thing. Uh, so I would estimate that volatility should go down, uh, but of course there's no certainty uh, for that. Uh, and of course that limits its use case or its practicality for day-to-day -day transactions if you don't just use it as a medium of exchange, because you then could immediately resell it and that's what most do and there are already payment providers of course who do that for you so the risk is very low you can accept of course crypto payments without having to uh, uh, bear the volatility uh, so there's an easy solution for that uh, and that was already found so I don't think that's the reason I think we see relatively a lot of enterprises companies accepting cryptocurrencies relatively a lot because there's not that much payment in them for various reasons i think one of the main reasons is that your incentives are not that good if you hold it and you believe in it to be it's the first thing that you part with you'd rather part with your fiat money uh, for your day-to-day -day, uh, payments uh, but still i think entrepreneurs are accepting it because an entrepreneur in opposition to someone who has coercive powers, really wants to have win-win relations, voluntary exchanges, so he tries to make it as easy as possible. And even some bureaucracies, even tax bureaucracies like the Swiss, out of an instinct and idea of the bureaucrat not being an enforcer, but your service provider, in a way, they have started except Bitcoin, and I don't think because they believe that much and cryptocurrencies just for the idea to make it as simple as possible. If people want to pay with that and it's feasible technologically, why not? Uh, well, and that's the difference, I think, to someone who coercively imposes what you need to pay your taxes in and how high they are, of course, which is the more important <laughs> coercion here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So now let's come to the last and the closing question round. Please, everybody of you answer this one. As far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if we go back in history, in the 17th century, the first central banks were established in the Netherlands, England, and Sweden. In 1816, the Austrian National Bank was founded the US Federal Reserve in 1913. That's only 107 years ago. The question is, looking at the potential of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, is there a possibility that in the same time central banks might be obsolete again? I ask a central banker, Beat. <laughs> That's too much of a cost <laughs> gap for me. I, I don't know. If, if, if. Many people see many advantages in anything uh, that's on offer in, in the Bitcoin universe. That might be the case. As far as I can see, I'm not able to see them. And most people I know, but maybe I'm in a bubble, uh, don't see that either. But, uh, well, who knows the future, yeah? Rahim? Uh, in one sense, of course, central banks are already obsolete because they are not fulfilling the function uh, they were built uh, to fulfill. Uh, and I think it's quite obvious if you study the history of central banks that they are in this sense obsolete. And I think it will be 
become more and more obvious that they are obsolete in that sense. That doesn't mean that they are going to disappear. Uh, if things really change on an institutional level, usually it's not because everyone agrees in a room and then the experts say, okay, oh, we really now need to adopt Bitcoin because central banks are not working. No, it happens for competition. Uh, and that's the only change to monetary policy I see through competition, of course. And we may even see some central banks perceiving their role in a competitive way. And I think geopolitics, for example, has been underestimated in trying to answer some of the questions before, like central banks even buying gold. So we can rule out that some central banks may buy cryptocurrencies in the future. Uh, and that's usually the way. It's not by understanding and experts determining if Libra now is compliant or not. Usually it's for competition and maybe geopolitical competition. Maybe just the US realizes that re Libra is really good for dollar-backed assets, so they'll be more favorable towards Libra. And that's more a realistic assumption of how changes like that uh, happen. So I think we're in very interesting times. We'll see lots of change during the next decade, some of it to the uh, worse, some of it to the better. I'm optimistic in the long term, and I think uh, cryptocurrencies will have a role in that change uh, that's happening right now, or part of the changes that are happening right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Arthur? Follow this line, uh, again, also I, uh, my statement is I don't think that uh, central banks will disappear. There is a certain political will that you have such institutions that there is something tangible. <laughs> it's called like this. On the other hand, uh, we, had, we didn't have this word today, disruptive. Yeah? I hate this word, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, questions systems institutions, intermediaries. Um, there is a certain speed, there's a, a certain cost pressure, there's a pressure on innovation. And uh, my observation is that central banks are considering to taking over the pro side. Why not? Yeah? And that's already a good development. Uh, so central banks will not disappear, in my opinion. But on the other hand, Bitcoin is here to stay, and we will see Bitcoin in the next years, decades, is my believing. Uh, I, I agree that central banks are here to stay. I think I said that before, and uh, as I paraphrased uh, Mark Twain, that uh, the, the report of the central bank's death was an exaggeration. So it's, uh, I, I believe it's here to stay because they fulfill a a useful function, and I have to disagree for, sorry, with Rahim, that they don't fulfill their mandate. The, at least the ECB's mandate is clearly stated in uh, whatever article it is, in the statutes and in the Treaty on European uh, uh, Functioning of the European Union, where it says the, the task of the ECB is to maintain price stability, full stop. And I think uh, we have price stability, uh, so that, in that sense, I think the mandate has been fulfilled. I think it's crucial to have a strong mandate, uh, and, but I think it all boils down to the users, to the people, what the people want, and the people want trust. They want to trust the money, because money is absolutely crucial, so they want to trust, they want to know who is issuing, who is behind it, who is ensuring it that when things get wrong or get bad, who is there. Is there a land of last resort, etc.? Uh, so I think uh, trust is crucial. And in the US, you always have this question, would you buy a used car from this person? Uh, so that at least uh, here uh, you have central banks. I think that that, that is important. And then to par uh, stop, finish and close the circle to Professor Polite and hopefully also Rahim, uh, quoting Milton Friedman. <laughs> Uh, the dissertation father of my dissertation father, who said, uh, a moderately stable monetary framework seems, an seems to be an essential prerequisite for an effective operation of a private market economy. I think we agree all on that. And then it said, it's dubious that the market can itself provide such a framework. Hence, the function of providing one, namely a framework, a monetary framework, is an essential governmental function on par with the provision of a stable legal framework. And I think, I hope at least on that, all four of us can agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time is over. Thank you for this lively discussion. Bye.